Nuclear war is getting more and more likely by the day, and unfortunately, it's just a fact of life that we might have to deal with. We've just finished setting up our fallout shelter, having it built, getting it stocked, getting all the tools and materials in it that are critically important to life in an emergency situation, including some things that most people probably wouldn't think about until the last minute when it's too late. If you're interested in what it takes to set something like this up at your house, including those things that most people forget to add, stick around. I love the chase and the hunt, and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want, and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now waiting, better believe in your mind, because it's everything. You can mold, shape, find almost anything. To talk about what's going on inside of our fallout shelter, we first have to start outside the fallout shelter. It's important to consider that quite a bit of what's going on on the inside is fed by things that are happening out here. And the first thing is what you see on top of the roof of our house right there. Those are all of our solar panels. That's 6,000 uh, watts of solar energy. And that is all being fed down into the uh, the fallout shelter, and that, that's important to start talking about the things that feed into it because you can't just throw yourself in a hole in the ground and expect yourself to, you know, thrive in there. You need other things, and a lot of those things are coming from the outside world, even if the outside world is not safe. And, you know, here are our chickens, and, you know, good luck, good luck to them if, uh, you know, anything ever happens, they can't really fit in with us into the fallout shelter. Uh, you know, but they would be one of the things outside. We'd give them as much food and water as we could, and then we'd we'd head inside. Uh, coming back uh, to where our fallout shelter actually is, it's under the ground in that lump ahead of me. But before we go in, again, there's more things outside. Uh, first off, in the, the far background there, you might be able to see some more solar panels. That's about uh, 700 watts of solar energy, and that is a backup solar electric system that that runs uh, not into the house but just into the fallout shelter so even if the primary system on top of the house went down we would have the backup system that we could potentially rely upon obviously if there was an emp you know both systems very well may go down and uh, you know we're going to talk about backup 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 plans for that uh, you know once we get inside uh, right in the foreground here looming uh, really attractively <laughs> is uh, another uh, piece of very important equipment uh, and this is the uh, outside air vent uh, you can see a couple of black pipes that are uh, uh, going from the uh, the box up on top down into the ground one of those black pipes goes into the house and that is the source for our air exchanger and the other one goes down into the root cellar uh, now, uh, we are only drawing from one at any one time, so we kind of close off the root cellar. Uh, you know, I, I might inadvertently call the fallout shelter a root cellar, uh, you know, throughout this video. And the reason for that is that uh, that is what it is primarily being used for at the moment is, is, is it's a really good root cellar. And uh, that helped to legitimize the cost for me. It was a fair bit of expense to build the thing. Uh, but knowing that we could use it as a root cellar, even if, uh, you know, and hopefully uh, if the uh, unthinkable uh, never happens. Uh, you know, it would not be a waste of money to have invested in putting it together because we can use it as a totally legit root cellar. So I, I, I might uh, inadvertently throughout the, this video refer to it as a root cellar, but uh, there you are one in the same. Uh, but this uh, this air uh, intake vent, it has filters in it, uh, you know, HEPA filters for drawing in air, and it supplies all the air for the house, for our air exchangers, and it can also be used uh, in the same way to supply air for the uh, fallout shelter, which again is right behind. Uh, you can see my shadow here. My shadow is being cast on these rocks right here. Uh, this is the upper wall, uh, you know, retaining a whole bunch of dirt up on top of the uh, the fallout shelter. Dirt and rocks and metal and other debris and things. Uh, one last uh, bit on this uh, air intake vent. Uh, you know, obviously I, I kind of joked about how attractive it is. It is not. It's just got this big plastic tub on top. That's being used as a temporary roof. Uh, eventually we're going to make something a little bit more attractive, but this is 100% totally functional and it keeps the uh, the rain from pooling on the top of it. So uh, let's look a little bit more about what's going on outside and soon we're going to be heading inside into the actual fallout shelter and uh, again it's really important what's going on on the outside out here. Now uh, we've got some some steps here you might be able to see some stone steps uh, cut into the ground there uh, right on top of this whole area and I'll try to kind of get up and give a little bit of an aerial aerial view of this uh, spot. We've got this this lump on the ground that goes from here 
all the way over there. This big lump. That is over the fallout shelter itself, and that is, it's pretty thick. Uh, we've got quite a bit of dirt and rock and metal on top of that. We'll talk a little bit more about the actual shielding that we have uh, going on on top uh, once we get inside. But we have uh, essentially uh, somewhere around 14 to 20 inches worth of dirt on the top and that's got all sorts of other things in there But if I had any metal debris I was sticking it in there if I had any rock debris I was sticking it in there because metal and rock offers better shielding than dirt although dirt is pretty good shielding in itself So let's come back down Around here and we're almost going to get inside But there's a couple more things that we want to look at on the outside one of them is popping out uh, right here and this is a light tube uh, light intake. There's a little glass uh, lid on the top and that goes into a, a tube that goes down into the ground and then does a 90 degree angle and then goes into the shelter. And the reason for the 90 degree angle is so that any uh, radiation that would be coming from the top and going straight through uh, here doesn't pummel people on the inside. The, the radiation would go straight down, it would hit the 90 degree bend and it would be absorbed by that bend and then uh, you know, only the light is allowed to kind of bounce around that uh, reflective area there. So uh, we've got multiples of those around. There's one uh, that you saw, another one here. There's a couple over on the far side of the structure. And before we go in, last thing we want to look at is some communication equipment. We've got a couple of different ways of getting information while we're in the shelter. And information while you're in the shelter is very important. You might be in the shelter and it's a false alarm. Maybe you, know, maybe you, you went in and, you know, because there was some concern that uh, you know, there might be a cloud of radioactive debris headed your way. And maybe it turns out you know, to, through good fortune that uh, you know, it was a false alarm and it's, it's not headed your way. So what we've got is we've got multiple ways of getting information in there. And this one's actually perhaps a little bit difficult to see. It kind of moves, it's a little green line <laughs> that moves along the trees here. And that is a uh, shortwave radio antenna. Uh, it might be a little difficult to see the antenna itself, but what we, what we can see is the wire that comes down from the tree and heads down over here, right into here. So this is where uh, the radio communications go down into the fallout shelter there. We've got a little grounding spike to ground out the radio. If you'd like to find out how to make your own shortwave radio, it is super, super easy, and it really doesn't have to cost very much at all. You can just make it out of like some scrap wire and some old uh, like cable TV wires and stuff like that. You can definitely make your own shortwave radio antenna very simply, and uh, I'll put a link on the screen uh, to uh, two videos that I did uh, that are about how to do that. First, how to build the antenna, and then how to ground it out. I have no real expertise in that type of thing and even someone like me can wrap my head around it so if i can figure it out you can definitely figure it out and we talk about it in very very simple terms so here we are we're at the uh front entrance of the fallout shelter uh, as you can see we paid some attention to making it kind of attractive it has kind of like a uh, a hobbit uh, house kind of feel to it i know the door is not round and it doesn't have the doorknob in the middle uh, but other than that i think it has a, kind of a nice little feel to it and we're gonna move right in from here. Now you'll notice all this rock here on the side, uh, that acts as more shielding, and you can get a pretty good sense of the thickness of it. Uh, the top of this door is just about at the ceiling level, and you can see how much extra dirt we have on top over there to give you a sense of the thickness. So we've got, like I said, uh, just about somewhere between 14 and 20 inches of dirt on top and that's mixed with rock and other debris. And then we have eight inches of concrete over our heads. Uh, so th it's quite a bit of shielding and it should do, uh, it should do definitely uh, reasonably well if we uh, ever needed to use this. We've got a hasp on here, uh, you know, for locking it up as being a root cellar. And also there's a fair bit of expensive equipment in here. So we also lock it up for those reasons. And let's, uh, let's head in. Right off the bat, we're gonna see if I can, uh, Get a little bit more light here on my camera. We're gonna see uh, this item here, and this is the uh, solar controller for the panels that only run into the, uh, the root cellar, the fallout shelter here. Uh, what we have here is a charge controller, and here we have an inverter, uh, and we have batteries, which are all underneath this decking. You can see this wire here comes uh, uh, you know, up from underneath the decking. There's a little dead air space over here, and uh, underneath there we have 10 deep cycle uh, lead acid batteries. Uh, let's see if we can 
No, I, I'm not actually going to go into that in this because, uh, you know, I've done other videos on that. I'll put a link to, uh, uh, you know, how to set up your own uh, solar electric basic system uh, here in this video. I don't want to get, you know, get into that uh, in here. Uh, but that's a, uh, all stored underneath uh, the step here. Uh, it's kind of convenient and it keeps it out of the way. We did run electricity in here, obviously. We talked about having the... Uh, uh, the, the solar energy from the house comes in here and we've got uh, some lamps that are attached to the sides of the wall here on either side and those run, uh, you know, a lot of power uh, runs through these little channels we've uh, created up here. By the way, here's one of those light tubes. They don't give you a ton of light, but they make it so you're not plunged into pitch blackness if you ever lose uh, electricity in here and all of those uh, lamps just run to this switchable outlet which is controlled from right here. Now all of this comes into the the fallout shelter from this port over here which is uh, sent over here from the house. Uh, well, through here we have power coming through, we have water coming through, we have some more data coming through, we have an internet cable from the house so that uh, if the internet was still functioning, although that's a highly dubious uh, uh, prospect <laughs> that it would be, but it was easy enough to run a internet wire through there. Uh, we also have an FM radio antenna, and you can see a couple of our uh, different types of antennas that we have here. Uh, get a little bit more light now that we're in the, the dark root cellar. Uh, we've got our shortwave radio port and an AM FM port, and below here we have a little monitor that monitors the, the solar pan uh, power for uh, just in this area. I do not have a way of monitoring the solar uh, system that is coming from the house. Uh, I certainly could have done that. I could have run some Cat5 cable and put an extra little monitor, but it would have just been a lot of extra expense and hassle, so I decided not to do that, and if the power goes down, uh, you know, we'll know it because there's no more power coming from the house, and we'll just use uh, things coming off of the uh, solar electric system in here. I mentioned we have water coming in here. Now that's this blue hose uh, that you see here. Uh, we've got a little port at the top that serves a couple of functions. One is that that port is going to make for convenient access to hook up this little hose, which is right over here. Uh, and what that hose can be used for is filling up all of these water jugs. Now, if we are coming in here and it, you know it's uh, you know, clear that there's a reason to be coming into the fallout shelter. Uh, we've got a go list of all different types of things we need to do, you know, uh, switches we need to flip and all that type of thing. Uh, but one of the things we, uh, we're going to be doing is filling up these water jugs with water from the house. And uh, these jugs here are just empty and they would be set in position. The hose would be screwed on up here. In fact, I think we'll probably have the, the hose pre-screwed on, ready to go up there once we finish kind of uh, a few last projects in here. Uh, and we'll be able to fill up, uh, what we have here is, uh, let's uh, two, four, six, eight, 10, 11. We've got 11 of these five gallon jugs and we would fill those up with fresh clean water right uh, at the outset of coming in here. Now let's say uh, there was an EMP pulse and the water just from the very beginning isn't working. We have no power, we have no water. Uh, what do we do then? Well, we, we do have pre-filled up a bunch of these jugs here and these are all filled up with water and some bleach is added because this is just coming out of our well. If you have uh, municipal water that already has chlorine uh, in it then uh, you can just uh, fill up jugs like this as long as they're all cleaned out and you keep them nice and uh, sealed. Uh, that, that water should last you, you know, at least a year for some reasonably long-term storage. Um, because ours comes from a well, I had to treat it with a little bit of chlorine bleach. It's about one quarter teaspoon per gallon. Uh, and I have 16 of these ready to go, and that would be plenty for the people that would be using this space. So uh, we've got lots of layers of redundancy, lots of layers of contingencies, uh, you know, if things don't work out. Right down here, what we get going on is a dehumidifier and that's an important thing if you're going to build a structure under the ground there's a high chance that it's going to have a lot of water in it uh, you know depending on where you live in the world you could have more water or less water uh, you know some places are pretty dry uh, here in New England uh, you know 
it, things get pretty damp underground. So we've got the dehumidifier running. That adds a little bit of heat to the air, which would be good if people were in here, but it's not so great uh, for using this as a root cellar. At the moment, we are at about 58 degrees in here, and that's comfortable. You know, I mean, if you had to live in a place that was 58 degrees, you know, sure, it's not the most wonderful uh, temperature to live at in the world, but it's certainly totally safe. Uh, you know, especially if you have, you know, the proper clothing to be uh, in there. So that's the temperature that we're kind of rocking at the moment while we're in here. Let's see what else we have uh, going on in here. I mentioned that we had uh, uh, electricity coming in and um, we have the ability to, uh, you know, have internet connections in here. And that gets into things like entertainment. Uh, you know, if you're going to be in a space like this, and we'll just get kind of like the the broadest view of this space that I can uh, from back in the corner over here. If you're going to be in a space like this for two weeks, and that's kind of the idea, if your area got blanketed in radiation, you'd want to be in that space for about two weeks. If you're going to be in there, you're going to want to have some things to do. Uh, and, you know, one of them is, you know, you can do uh, movies or listen to music, play computer games. Uh, you know, again, if the Internet is still functioning, you would have a way of getting information and entertainment that way. Uh, so we've We've got things uh, set up for that kind of thinking that, you know, people would want to live in here and enjoy themselves to some degree. Uh, we've got a power strip uh, right here and the power strip, uh, you know, allows you to, you know, charge up any electronic devices that you might want to use. Uh, one item that is not in here yet is uh, a table. There's going to be a table attached to the wall right in this area through here. And uh, that'll allow us to like, you know, set up things if you want to draw or write or you know, use a computer or a, a tablet or any kind of electronic device. Uh, that's going to be set in uh, place in you know, the next couple of days. It's not super critical, so I figured I'd do this video anyway. Um, and what are these racks right here? What these racks are are racks for you know, storing food if we were using this as a root cellar. But at the moment, we're kind of prepping it more to be used as a potential fallout shelter uh, because it's not really cold enough in here yet to use it as a root cellar. We're not quite into winter yet. Uh, and also, unfortunately, the prospect for potential nuclear war is a little on the high side. So we're kind of more leaning towards fallout shelter here at the moment. But what these are is bunks. Uh, we've got one bunk on the top, one in the middle, and the lower bunk right there. We've got a little bit of storage space under here. We're going to talk about what this thing is in just a little bit. Uh, but first, I want to talk about what we have for uh, you know preparations for these bunks. Uh, they're just built out of two by fours and two by threes. Uh, underneath, we've got some uh, one by three strapping slats, and that is holding up this surface here, which is just kind of a uh, like a fiberboard uh, kind of material. As you'll notice, is quite a bit of. Uh, support under there. Uh, it's uh, essentially uh, about two and a half inches of support and then like a two and a half inch gap and then two and a half inches of support, two and a half inch gap. Uh, so it seems to be able to hold up quite a bit of weight. In fact, each one of these uh, jugs of water is about 40 pounds. Uh, so we've got four times uh, 40 right there. So we've got 160 pounds there, 160 pounds over on this other side, uh, it certainly seems to be able to hold up quite a bit of, uh, of weight. And the reason that I have these on the ends instead of in the middle is whenever you're uh, trying to load something up, over here on the ends, you're really close to these supports uh, that are all, uh, holding up the, uh, you know, the weight of the bunk. Out in the middle here, you don't have quite as much uh, support. What you, you might see here is this little pole up the middle. Now that does offer a little, a little bit of added support. It's kind of holding this and connecting it to this, so it does time together and does serve a bit of a structural purpose. But primarily, uh, the reason we have that is so that people don't roll out of their bunk beds and fall down onto the floor. Now, what what is down on the floor? Now, when this place was created, the walls are made of concrete and the floor is made of concrete. Uh, but that would make for a pretty uncomfortable environment to be living in. So, what we created uh, down on the floor here is these. Uh, kind of uh, exercise mats. They're the kind of interlocking exercise mats that might be at a gym or something. And these are three quarters of an inch thick. Uh, they came in multiple colors, white and gray and black and blue. And I chose blue. I think it should probably be for an obvious reason that, you know, in a space like this, getting any kind of color is probably a good thing. So we went with blue just because uh, it, it livens the place up. And if you're going to have to be in here for two weeks, I think it's one extra additional way of trying to keep you from going absolutely crazy. Although, I, if we were stuck in here, I don't know what these walls would look like at the end. <laughs> I would probably have, uh, you know, some uh, a lot of drawing going on in the walls, some checker marks, and that maybe the drawings would get progressively crazier looking uh, as the uh, the weeks pressed on. So, what else do we have going on uh, in here? Uh, I mentioned. Uh, 
we want to uh, be able to you know sleep in here. We've got a couple of uh, of mats right here. Uh, these are just roll out camping mats, and uh, we've got one of them for each of the. Uh, uh, little bunks. Uh, in addition to that, I have camping bags that would be brought in here. And on top of each one of these little mats, I've got little extra inflating camping pads that would go on top. So it should be a pretty comfortable surface to sleep on. I've slept on just the camping pads alone, and those are fine. And then if you're adding this extra kind of uh, uh, foam camping pad under it, uh, it should be a pretty comfortable uh, sleeping uh, situation. We've got a box full of bedding, sheets, and blankets up here. Uh, we've got clothing here. We've got some books. Uh, again, entertainment, important to have some kind of an outlet, uh, you know, something to do for those uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I, I, I personally plan on writing the great American novel <laughs> while I'm stuck in here. I'm kidding about that. Uh, we've got other things over here. We've got notebooks, sketchbooks, crayons, pencils, pens, markers. Obviously, there's a kid involved here. That's why we've got the crayons and the magic markers. Although, you know, adults can do some pretty amazingly beautiful artwork with, uh, with crayons as well. We're going to uh, come to these shelves in a little bit. But first, I want to kind of finish up over here. And there is one thing that is super, super important that we haven't uh, touched on at all yet. And that is behind this little candy wrapper right here. What is that? going on back there. Uh, this is an old candy wrapper from uh, Halloween candy from uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm using it as a cover for this thing right here, which is a vent fan. It's a four inch vent fan and this runs directly out to that um, air intake filter that's outside. So if we wanted to get air in here, and you absolutely would want to get fresh air in here, otherwise this uh, fallout shelter is gonna turn into your grave, uh, we can turn on this fan and it will draw air in through those filters. And the filters are super important because if you have radioactive dust outside and it starts coming into your shelter, then what's the point of being in a shelter? Because you're bringing all of the outside to the inside. So this thing can draw the air directly through all of the uh, uh, the filtration and it brings it into the space here at a really healthy clip. Uh, you know, it really blows it in and uh, I'm not sure what the uh, air exchange rate of the entire airspace is, but I, it's more than adequate. It works very, very well. I'll put a link in the description below to these particular fans because I, I use them a lot. They're very quiet, they're very energy efficient, and they seem like they, they work really well without breaking down. I've never had a problem like that. But let's say they do break down, or let's say we don't have electrical power. Uh, certainly the, the latter of those two is entirely uh, possible and maybe even likely. Uh, how are we going to breathe in here? Well, that is where this unit down here comes in. It's important, important, important to have air in your shelter. Uh, water is really important, but air is even more important. You can go for a couple of days without water, but only a couple of minutes without air. And, you know, and, and during the entire time you're without air, you're going to be suffering. So I created this device right here. What I'm going to do, I'm going to kind of uh, set the camera down on the floor here. Sorry, there's a little bit run and gun, but I'm sure you guys can bear with me. Okay, I set the camera down on the floor. I'm going to show you what this thing does. It is a bellows. And what it does is it draws air in from one side. It draws it in from this side. As you see, I open it up. This opens up. It draws it in. And then when I blow it out, this thing closes and it blows out the other side. And this thing here, which I will just slide back. By the way, it has a really uh, handsome little uh, handle made out of a, a piece of forest uh, uh, timber that I cut down. Uh, I'll show you on the other side. It's drawing in. And then when I push it down, this will open up. I blow the air out. Yeah. Oh, it looks like this, one of these blades is a little bit sticky. There we go. Okay. So we can get quite a bit of air through. And it, and it doesn't take much effort at all. You can kind of push on it with your legs. You can uh, you know, do, actuate it with your hands. I'm going to slide that right back where it came from. In here. And we'll, uh, we'll start floating around again. And that fits into this bracket, which is right on the wall. It slides down into this, this U-shaped bracket, and it interacts with the, uh, uh, the air intake right there. And you can keep uh, supplying air to the shelter using uh, you know, just that one air device. Would I enjoy doing that, like 24-7? I don't think you'd have to do it every second of the day. You'd probably like, you know, uh, I don't know. We're going to be running a test pretty soon, and that's actually something I want to mention in this video. We're going to be doing a live stream where we are testing this thing out for uh, possibly like 
an entire day. We really want to see, like, you know, uh, how does everything perform? You know, do all of our systems work all right? You know, uh, how much carbon dioxide are we accumulating? We have a uh, carbon dioxide monitor. And, uh, you know, we're going to be running tests on all these things. So uh, we will be doing as part of the test, uh, shutting down the fan and seeing, uh, you know, how much work it takes to, uh, to pump air into the space. With multiple people in here, you can see we've got three different bunks. Uh, you know, you, people can obviously take turns with it. Uh, I think it's going to be manageable, but, you, you know, you never know until you, uh, you know, do a real test. All right, so we're going to start talking about some other things that are going on in here. Uh, before we get there, I just want to talk about this little narrow aisle right here, those little blue things. Those are chairs. I think it's really important to have multiple ways of kind of being in an environment. Uh, the space in here is, I believe these walls are seven feet tall. I think these are seven foot tall walls. So you can stand up pretty well. You can even kind of stretch your arms, maybe not stretch them completely out over your head. Uh, you can lay down in the bunks. And I think it's also important for people to be able to sit. So we have some chairs as well, just so you know you don't feel like you were in kind of a controlled position and you can't uh, you know can't change your position. We've got an awful lot of food here, and I'll talk briefly about that towards the end. But before we get into that, I want to talk about some of the other things that we have uh, in here in terms of supplies uh, for you know our preparations in here. Um, although before we do that, there's one case right over here which is kind of important. This is a Faraday. Uh, bucket right there. Uh, that has some important equipment in there. Uh, there are radios in there. Uh, we have uh, battery chargers in there. All different types of electronic equipment that I feel are kind of important. We've got inside of that Faraday box and uh, that would tend to keep things uh, you know, having a higher degree of likelihood that they would be able to survive through an EMP pulse because uh, even if all, all your systems go down, there are certain electronic equipment like, uh, you know, little flashlights and things like that that would be really handy to be able to, uh, to keep, and th that's where we have that stuff. Some of the other types of equipment that we have that is not uh, quite so sensitive or not quite so critical are over in uh, some of these bins. Uh, this bin here, is, we can see there's a little space heater. I don't know that a space heater would be necessary. I think, uh, if anything, with having three people in here, you, your major issue is probably going to be keeping it cool, not keeping it warm. But we want to have the options, uh, you know, if it's super cold and we're bringing in a lot of cold, uh, cold air from the outside, you know, maybe we would, we would want to have a heater and we at least want to have the option. We have two heaters in he here because two is one and one is none. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's important to always have redundancy on things that might potentially be very important. We have uh, some bags in here, rolls of bags. Uh, which you see here, some clear plastic bags and some black plastic bags. And those are to interact with this, which is a five gallon bucket with a toilet seat that is clipped on to the top, which actuates better with two hands than with one. <laughs> so there we go. You see some staining in the toilet, just uh, full disclosure, that is uh, outside um, wall stain. It's, it's not poop in there. Uh, th this bucket had uh, uh, seal for the outside of our house so that's that's what those brown streak marks are on the inside of that although you know after two weeks who knows what that thing would look like uh so we've got lots of sanitation uh type stuff in here the plan uh, at the moment is that what we would do is when people got to do their number two, uh, they would put a bag inside of the bucket, uh, they'd poop in the bag, and we have enough bags so that everyone could take a couple of number twos per day for the two-week period. Um, if we go beyond that, you know, they'll have plenty of extra space in the bags, and we would be able to, uh, you know, I guess uh, double and triple up if we absolutely had to. But the idea is, is that uh, we have enough capacity so that uh, we can have, uh, you know, 15 times six poops uh, in their own separate bags with twist ties uh, and just close them up. And we would just throw them, I don't know, maybe just around this corner over here. Um, we might be able to use them as shielding. <laughs> They'd be radioactive shielding poops. I mean, it, it sounds funny, but I mean, it, it would act as shielding. You know, we'd probably just kind of throw those around the corner, get them out of our way. But that's the idea is you poop in a bag, uh, seal the thing up, and then just kind of move it out of your living space. And then you deal with it in two weeks later on. We've got other things. We just got plastic sheeting. I don't have any particular reason why we might want to have that, but you know, it's good to have plastic sheeting. We have duct tape. We have some uh, black trash bags here. One potential reason why we might want to have shielding is uh, this way to go in and out of the shelter. Uh, this is an area you can't really be in. Uh, actually, the overexposure from the outside, I think, gives a good sense of what we would be experiencing is uh, if you stood where I'm standing right now, uh, you know, right in front of this door, that door outside, and I'll just let you see a little bit better what that door looks like. 
that's just a wooden door with a little bit of uh, foam insulation on it. That is not going to block any kind of radiation. So if you're standing here, you're going to be being baked in radiation from uh, the doorway. So uh, one plan that we have for that is, well, I mean, the primary plan is we're just not going to be over there. Uh, we've got the same kind of geometric shielding that we talked about earlier in regard to the, uh, the light tubes. Remember how I said the light tubes go straight down and then they have a 90 degree bend? Well, we have the same situation right here where you come in and then you do a 90 degree bend uh, as you come into the space. The ionizing radiation that would be coming from the doorway is going to be coming straight across here and it'll be hitting this wall, and this wall will just be absorbing all of that radioactive energy. That does not make that wall radioactive, it just means the wall is being pummeled with energy. And much better the wall than your body. So our primary uh, way of staying safe from that area is just to not go over in that area. Uh, the secondary <coughs> excuse me, way that we're going to uh, try to cut down on radiation coming in is there's a couple of steps right there. Uh, we got this step here and a step here. and these water jugs that we have here, they are to supply us with water, but they also can serve another purpose, and they will serve another purpose. And that other purpose that these jugs are going to serve is that they are going to be able to be used as radio, uh, radiation shielding. Now, this is something that comes up in a lot of people's uh, questions, and I'll just address it right now. If you use water in a sealed jug as radio, uh, radiation shielding, and the water gets exposed to radioactive energy that does not make the water unsafe to drink as long as the water is in a sealed container and there are no radioactive particles falling into it. The simple fact of the water being pummeled with uh, radioactive energy does not make the water radioactive in itself or unsafe to drink in any way. So what our plan is, is you can see these five gallon jugs, they kind of, uh, they've got a little stacking kind of uh, ability on the top. And the plan is that what we would do is we would uh, just stack those things right on these steps here. We can make a wall, and I've kind of calculated it out, we can do one wall of 12 jugs and then one wall of nine jugs. There's gonna be gaps all around it, but anything that you can possibly fill in uh, is going to uh, you know, make your ability to you know, reduce some of that radiation coming in uh, you know, a, a little bit better. And th there are things here that maybe don't wanna be hit with radiation, like these, uh, try to get a proper exposure here. Like, the, you know, this, uh, this electronic equipment. Uh, electronic equipment can be fried by radioactivity, and I, I would tend to suspect that it would n not be anywhere near enough radiation to actually damage any of this stuff, but who knows? You know, you want it to you know, minimize things as much as you can, and we, we, we would be using some of the uh, jugs of water as radiation shielding uh, right in that area there. So what else do we have going on? Uh, I, this whole story started by me uh, discussing the idea of this plastic material. Well, uh, the plastic material could be used to create kind of a barrier across this area. We could tape it up and make it so we're not having uh, air kind of leaking into this area. Now, we do need air leaking out of the entire shelter. We are, we're pumping air in. The, the air needs to be allowed to escape. And at the moment, uh, I feel like there are enough little gaps here and there that the air can kind of uh, push through all of those gaps and that is going to make it so that uh, you create that positive pressure and you don't have uh, air from outside just kind of leaking in on its own. Uh, but one thing uh, that might come up is like what if one of us has to go outside during the emergency? I have no idea uh, what that situation would be like but I think it's important to prepare for that if that happened. You know, it, far better to need the stuff and not, uh, I'm sorry, far better to have the stuff and not need it than needed it and not have it. And if you found for some reason there was some life or death reason why you needed yourself or someone to go outside, you'd want some ability to do that as a, in the most protected way that you possibly could, uh, as opposed to doing it with no protection. If someone were going to go outside, you'd want to have some kind of a plastic cloth up here to kind of seal this area off as kind of a, a bulkhead so that uh, when this door, this door gets opened and, you know, air kind of comes in, you're not having that air, you know, the air would kind of, you know, it would drop radi radioactive dust in this area, but you'd want to try to make it stop at some point. So putting up some of that sheeting uh, would be a way of kind of limiting the uh, deleterious effects of having this door be opened and then closed while you are... Uh, in this space. Uh, if you are going to go out into the space, this gets to uh, some other uh, equipment that we have here. And this is all up here. We've got coveralls. 
uh, and the coveralls are, you know, exactly what they sound like. They are for covering you head to toe. They're disposable. I think I have about 20 in there, and uh, they cover up your body. So if you have to go out, you wear one of these, and when you're coming back, you just shed the thing and leave it outside, and, and that's the end of it. So if you get dust on it, everything stays outside. What else do we have here? We've got uh, respirators and CBRN filters. Uh, if you're going to be outside, you don't want to be breathing dust into your lungs. So we've got uh, all the respirators and the filters that we would need for that type of thing here. And additionally, we have lead clothing. Uh, this is the type of stuff that you would uh, maybe see at a dentist's office. You know, if you're ever getting x-rays at a dentist's office, they lay uh, lead clothing uh, over you, or, or the uh, x-ray uh, technician might be uh, having some kind of a smock. That's what this stuff is. Uh, additionally in there, I just have a sheet of, I believe, uh, 16 or I think 1 8 inch lead sheeting. And what we can do with that is that we can just, uh, uh, you know, cut it to make like a helmet or cut it to like, you know, like co cover your crotch or whatever you might want to do with it. Uh, but it, it allows you to kind of make a bit of a suit of armor uh, for, uh, you know, going out if you had to. Again, ain't nobody want to go out during that kind of situation, but if you had to, you know, you definitely would prefer that you had the materials to make your trip out at least a little bit safer for yourself and for the people that you're coming back to. You know, if you get your clothes all covered in radioactive debris and you're coming back, then, you know, you're going to not only put yourself at risk, but everybody else back in the shelter. So these are things we absolutely hope we never have to use, but we have them here in case we need them. Uh, what else do we have going on in here? Uh, we got our onions in here. <laughs> That's just we actually do use this as a root cellar to some degree, uh, and uh, you know we've got onions and we've got uh, we got some potatoes in here. And hopefully over the winter we'll be able to start bulking up on more of that stuff as it gets cooler in here. Uh, well, there are there would be a female in here uh, while we are uh, you know down in the shelter. So we have uh, you know all things related to that tampons, pads, things like that. Uh, we're thinking about our dental needs, you know, toothbrushes, toothpaste, uh, floss, all that kind of thing. We've got a whole box just full of medical stuff, and this is all different things. We've got extra respirators in there, Q-tips, uh, the stuff if anyone gets like athlete's foot, uh, there's a, things for a vaginal yeast infection. We've got towels in there for, you know, after you bathe, and we're going to talk about bathing in a little bit. Uh, washcloths, all different types of other medicines, uh, you know, uh, Tylenol, uh, you know, uh, which is acetaminophen, ibuprofen. Uh, there's aspirin in there, uh, you know, different types of uh, cough lozenges, uh, you know, all those types of things that, you know, you can't run out to the, the convenience store to grab. You know, we're thinking ahead about any of those types of things you might want and need, and we're having those in there. Uh, down in the bin below here, we've got a lot of electronic stuff, including two Geiger counters. Geiger counters are absolutely important uh, to know what the conditions are like outside of your shelter. We mentioned the idea that it's very important to have... Um, uh, you know, information coming into your shelter, but let's say information gets, cu gets cut off, or let's say the information during an emergency is about as accurate as the information that we tend to get uh, outside of an emergency. And we, what I mean by that is, you know, the government may want to sugarcoat things, uh, you know, to make it seem like things aren't necessarily as bad as they are. They want to get people back to work. They, they, there are projects that need to be done, so there might be a tendency to tell people that things are, you know, uh, safer than maybe they actually are. If that sounds like a conspiracy, uh, it is. It's a conspiracy to try to make sure that the situation doesn't get even worse than it would be otherwise. It is in all of our best interest for people to get out and start performing tasks and services, but it is not in those people's individual interests. And governments look out for the broad society, they look out for the, the masses. They want to make sure the most people have the, you know, the, the best possible outcome, you know, unless you prescribe to the idea that they, they only care about their, you know, elite selves and they have, you know, no interest in, in, in anybody else. But if, if you don't want to go down that particular rabbit hole, you have plenty of reason not to trust what the government is literally saying, because even if their interest is in keeping the society itself safe and people at large safe, they are not necessarily going to be releasing information that is uh, aimed at you personally, your best interest. So if you want to know what the radiation level is in the area where you are, it would be really good to have your own Geiger counter. I imagine they're pretty expensive right now. I've had mine for uh, quite some time, and I've got them sealed up in that little lunchbox in there. Uh, it's its own individual Faraday box in there, and uh, you know they are there for us to 
have access to that information if information isn't coming over the airwaves or if we feel like maybe we can't totally trust what's coming over the airwaves. We also have some extension cords, power strips, things of that nature in there. Uh, this bin here is all full of cooking stuff. You can see some uh, spoons, uh, uh, spoons and forks. There are pots in here, little hot plates that we can run off electric. We have a lot of our food that we can eat without cooking it, but food often tastes better when you cook it. We've got uh, cooking pots, uh, you know, cooking spoons, ladles, cups, bowls, uh, you know, serving things of all types in there. That, that's what we have all in in that uh, that particular bin. Uh, we've got this cloth on the wall here. Uh, this is a shower curtain and it's running on this little, can I see it? No, here it is. This little line here. I ran a line from one side over to the other and it allows this shower curtain, eventually I, I've got some shower curtain rings which I can't find. Uh, push comes to shove, we could always use twist ties. Uh, I haven't hung it up yet, but the idea is we can run the shower curtain across this area and create privacy for our bathroom area. Uh, so when people want to come over here, uh, they can use the toilet without, uh, you know, feeling like they're, uh, uh, you know, on display. Uh, and also people can bathe. And we're going to talk about bathing in a little bit. The bathing area is going to be this area right here while trying not to get too close to this corner because you do have radiation coming around here. But this area kind of over here is where the bathing would happen and the shower curtain runs right across here. So you can kind of back right up to it. We're gonna talk in just a moment about bathing. But first I wanna kind of uh, cover what we got on these uh, shelves in to uh, completely. Uh, what we got in here is more medication and this stuff is specifically aimed at radiation sickness. These are things that we have in here. If someone gets exposed to radioactive material, uh, that creates a physiological response in the body. And we have stocked up on lots of things to try to flush that out of their system. And when that's being flushed out of their system, it could be coming out in their poop. And that's another reason to get the poop out of your living environment. The poop could be radioactive if people have any of that stuff uh, you know, coming out that way. I uh, would... I'm, I'm inclined not to talk about everything that's in this box. It's super important, and I think that you should definitely know what's in this box, but I'm not gonna talk about it in this video because Hoople's Cat did an excellent video on it. I'm gonna put a link uh, you know, right here on the screen and down in the description below, perhaps. So you can check out Hoople's Cat's video on everything that you should have in this box. He did a lot of research. He's got a great channel. He's a very reputable and reliable source of information. Uh, I would highly recommend uh, subscribing to his channel in general and specifically check out his video about these things because these uh, medications are the type of thing that if you get into a situation where you were exposed to radiation, you would be really happy that you have a lot of stuff. Some of the stuff's more expensive, some of the stuff's pretty cheap. Uh, you know, if you don't have a lot of money, you know, just get the cheap stuff. And, you know, maybe it would be nice if you could ex uh, afford some of the more expensive things, but, uh, you know, it doesn't all, things don't always have to be all or nothing. Some of the stuff in there is just Tums uh, or uh, Benonite clay. Some of these things are really, really inexpensive. And, you know, even if you can't get some of the more expensive uh, medicines, you know, at least get the cheap ones because those are gonna do some good and they'll help you to flush some things out of your body and better to be flushing out some of it than none of it. Uh, and the way to find out what you need in that bin is check out Hoople's Cat's uh, channel. We also have a couple of uh, heating pads on top here. These are just foot uh, heating pads. Uh, you know, again, if it's cool in here, you could put your feet on those and uh, it's a, kind of a low electricity way of getting heat into your body. All right, uh, over here, I'm gonna jump to this side. Uh, these, is, these are obviously mostly uh, you know, food related, uh, but we can kind of go through them a little bit here. Uh, and we do have something kind of related to uh, radiation right here, which is uh, ginger ale. Uh, ginger ale is really good for nausea and we've got a bunch of ginger ale. Uh, actually, uh, Hoople's Cat, if you happen to be watching this, we've got uh, this here, the spruce beer is from Canada. I'm not sure, maybe that's from your local store. A friend, of us was, uh, a friend of ours was up there and she grabbed us some of that. Uh, but the ginger ale is there for, for nausea. I, ginger ale can make a huge difference in terms of uh, you know feeling terribly sick or you know not feeling terribly sick. So we have plenty of ginger ale uh, in here in case people do. Uh, the foods, well, I'm just gonna kinda hammer through them really, really quickly. In fact, I, I think I'll kind of come back to here. We've got some cheese macaroni that is easy to cook. And that, that's many cases all the way back on the shelf. You can see how thick the shelf is and it's cheese macaroni uh, front to back over there. We've got some sprouting seeds. We're gonna bring sprouting trays in here so you can get fresh greens. That's super important. Uh, behind there, we've got some protein powder. We have a bunch of protein powder uh, containers. We've got Gatorade for replacing electrolytes. That's a great thing if people are not feeling well. We've got some black tea here. Uh, you know, again, uh, it's a way of, uh, you know, soothing people if they're not feeling all that great. Plus, I just love tea. 
uh, down on this shelf, we've got uh, lots of canned fruits. We've got way more. I'm gonna I'm gonna beat you to the chase here. We have way more canned fruit in this fall at shelter than we would ever. <laughs> My God, the diarrhea that we would have if we actually ate all the, the canned fruit in here. The reason we have so much in here is again we use this as a root cellar, and you know it, it's it's a place where we keep that stuff. Um, so <laughs> we have absolutely no worries of running out of canned fruit <laughs> if we ever need to be in here for two weeks. Uh, we've got enough for two years probably. Uh, got some peanut butter for protein in there, more protein. We've got uh, cashew nuts. We've got some pretzels here. Behind the pretzels are Halloween candy. We just bought some Halloween candy this year. You know, because treats are important, you know, especially if you have a kid, it's just, you know, it's a, a mental pick-me-up. This whole thing, as you can see, is full of treats. We've got some gummy bears on there and lots of clothespins. If you are bringing bags of like chips or anything like that into your shelter, you want to be able to close those things up. So bring some clothespins so you can pin those things shut later on. Uh, what we've got here is some this dried fruit and this mango, yeah, dried mango. Behind that, a bunch of Cliff Energy protein bars. We've got pasta. We've got pasta sauce. That's stuff that we can cook, uh, you know, if we have electricity. Down here, I've got a whole gallon of uh, rice uh, preserved in there with a little desiccant pack in there. We've got some dried vegetable uh, mix in there. Some bullion cubes in here. Uh, the bullion cubes are in this uh, mylar with a desiccant pack in there because uh, if they're in a environment that gets moist at all, uh, the, the bullion cubes get all melty. Uh, we've got some uh, ramen noodles, not the best quality ramen noodles, I'll, I'll admit to that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's again, it's a nice, uh, nice warm meal if you, uh, you know, just need some food and uh, kind of an emotional pick me up to have a nice warm meal. Uh, it gets everybody feeling better. Uh, we've got a lot of baked beans. This is three tiers of baked beans here. Uh, that's something you can eat un. Uh, heated or heated, either way works. Uh, what else we got down here? Uh, here's all that uh, canned fruit I warned you about. The entire, uh, everything you're seeing here is all canned fruit. Way more than we would ever need, but you know, it's nice. There'd be no end to how much canned fruit we need. Actually, I lied, not all of this canned fruit. This here is canned corn over here. All right, over on this side, uh, we have a bunch of bricks of soy and almond milk here. We also have some cow milk uh, in Tetra Packs there for long-term storage, uh, you know, th that it could be used for drinking and also for cereal. And as a matter of fact, at the time of this recording, while I'm doing this, I'm realizing I have not brought the cereal out into this space yet. And cereal would be a really great thing to have out here, especially if you get that much milk. So uh, we'll be adding cereal to our, our, uh, our pile here as well. And uh, I thank you very much for bearing with me so I could uh, have that mental, uh, uh, light bulb go off in my head. We've got some more Gatorade. This stuff does not have to be mixed. It's already mixed with water. Uh, and a bunch of juice boxes over here. Uh, that's an awful lot of juice boxes, more than we would need. Uh, again, we use this as a storage space and I, I take those juice boxes uh, with us when we go camping with my boy. And uh, you know, we just, we store them here. So that's why we have, we have so many of those things. And the last thing to really talk about is just the, the toiletry stuff. I, I mentioned uh, about how we'd be using uh, the bucket over here. Uh, we've got uh, toilet paper over there uh, that's ready to go. Uh, if we ever lost water uh, pressure, uh, water pressure is going to the sink. Uh, well, right now it's turned off, so I can't demo it for you. But we do have water pressure going to the sink. It has a little uh, drain that goes out through the wall and goes into the uh, the, the drain around the slab under the, underneath the structure. Uh, if we ever lost water pressure, what we could do is we could take one of those five gallon jugs and this is a lid made to fit one of the five gallon jugs and we could put it up on the shelf over here and we could uh, screw this into it and we would get at least a little bit of gravity uh, fed water from those jugs because it's, it's oftentimes just easier to wash up if you have like a little trick trickle from a sink instead of you know trying to pour water out of a jug onto your hands you can be a lot less wasteful with the water and it's you know just a more comfortable experience so we would be able to use gravity to push some water into the system uh, if we wanted to do that and the last thing we wanted to talk about was just uh, the bathing thing uh, I mentioned that we would be using this floor space right in here uh, for bathing. And the plan for that is we have uh, some very, very large plastic bags. And uh, this is the last thing that I have to finish up myself is uh, essentially what you would be doing is we're going to put the bag on the floor and make kind of a hanging device where you can pull the sides of the bag using some grommets on the bag up around you. And you'll take just a, a bucket or a pot of water that you warm up over the stove and just sponge off. You know, just use a washcloth and sponge off. The water will fall to the bottom of the bag. And then when we're done, we just would pick up the bag and uh, 
and pour the entire bag, kind of awkwardly, probably take a couple of people down into the sink. So that is our plan for bathing. And bathing is really important. You can't just not bathe for two weeks. Uh, I mean, you'll get like bed sores and just, it'll be awful, it'll be awful. So it's important to have a plan for all that. The most important thing that I could suggest to you um, is I turn off the lights and we pass out of this environment. The most important thing that I could suge suggest to you um, if you are thinking about doing any of this stuff, is is really important to, uh, oh, here's one of our occupants right here. What are you looking for, River? Oh, okay. Uh, the most important thing that I could suggest to you is to just take whatever plan you have in your mind and really, uh, really think it through for every, every step of the way. And I'll tell you what I mean. We have an, uh, a go action plan for leaving the house and coming into the shelter. And I've put it down on paper and it has step by step what I need to do uh, as we're leaving the house. And that includes things like turning on the water pressure to the, uh, to the root cellar. It includes things like uh, making sure that the power is turned off in the rest of the house. We wanna be sending every single drop of power that we have into the shelter, not into the rest of the house. We want you know, all the alarm clocks and all the phantom drains that are in the house cut off of power and every little drop coming off of those solar panels running into the shelter. Now that might seem a little bit weird. I mean, we, we can run an entire house off of those solar panels, but I'm afraid of being able to run just this tiny little shelter. Well, if there was a nuclear exchange, what's likely to happen to the skies is they're not gonna be really bright and sunny like this. You know, we might have very, very cloudy days and there's not perhaps gonna be that much sun hitting the panels. So whatever little bit is hitting, you want that to be squeezing you know, into the shelter here. Um, but getting back to you know, the idea of thinking these things through, one of the items on the list, like I said, is killing all, killing all the power to the house except what's being sent to the shelter. Uh, while I'm doing all those types of things, you know, River has uh, things that he's uh, grabbing. You know, he's grabbing his toys, he's grabbing his books and things that he might like. Uh, you know, Amber who lives with us, she, you know, there's things that she's gonna be uh, grabbing as well. Uh, let's say this thing happens at nighttime and I'm there and I'm killing power to the house and I kill all the breakers to the house while other people are still trying to pack up that's gonna be a problem. So it's really important to kind of think these things through in real time and if it's at all possible, try practicing uh, them. You know, try actually doing a dry run, moving through these things and see like, you know, if you make your own go list and you have uh, tasks of things that people need to be doing, you know, make sure that it doesn't end up being a situation where everybody's all piling into the same room at the exact same time and, you know, people are banging into each other. One thing that we want to make sure that we do in the house is close all the windows, close all the blinds, and close all the doors in the house. The reason for that is you want the least amount of stack effect uh, going on in your house where uh, the sun comes in the window, warms the air in the house, causes it to rise, it, you know, it leaks out, you know, small creaks, or, uh, I'm sorry, small cracks around your window. Uh, uh, frame around your house and when the, the air is leaking out of your house that air has to be replaced with other air from outside and as that air is being drawn into your house that's going to be drawing radioactive dust into your house with it. So to try to minimize how much radioactive dust is getting into our house, uh, you know, one of the things we're doing is uh, closing all the windows, closing all the doors to try to make it so air is just not moving around inside the house very much while we're not in there. Um, and one of the steps that we need to do in order to accomplish that is that we need to uh, you know, close all those doors and close all those windows. But again, if this is happening in the middle of the day and all the windows, uh, all the blinds are being shut, you know, people aren't gonna be able to see uh, in, in the different rooms. Or, uh, you know, if people are closing all the doors and then people are still going in and out of all these rooms and they're reopening doors and then someone has to go back and reclose all the doors. It's all these types of things. You need to kind of game out in your head and do them ahead of time. And, and you know, just do a practice run on it and just, uh, you know, do kind of a sanity check and make sure that your plan is going to run smoothly. It doesn't take that much to kind of go through it. Uh, I mean, depending on how you want to look at it, it can kind of be, like a fun sort of experiment adventure to, to work through the whole thing. Uh, and uh, it can make everything just run a whole lot smoother. And I'm gonna end the video right here, uh, right in front of the garden. And the reason I wanna end it here is because there's one last thing you might wanna think about. And that is, you know, what are you going to do after two weeks? After two weeks, you know, you can emerge from the, your, your shelter and the environment around you is going to be a lot less dangerous than it was but it's not necessarily gonna be perfectly safe. 
Now, one option that you might have is to, to leave. You know, this is a beautiful house that I've built here. It's a beautiful area. I would, I would really hate to leave this area, but if I know that living here is going to increase the risk of myself getting cancer or my boy getting cancer, you know, we're, we're going to we're going to pick up and we're going to go someplace else. Uh, you know, that's, that sucks. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. We'd really hate to, you know, lose our access to this place. But, uh, you know, that might be the best, uh, the best choice for us. But let's say there is no place to go. Let's say, you know, everywhere has been dusted and there really isn't a place that's particularly better or worse. Or even if there are places that are better, maybe politically it's hard to go there because, you know, uh, you know you'd become the, the, the new refugee and, you know, we all see how refugees are treated in our world. Maybe it makes more sense, maybe it's safer uh, overall, cumulatively, to stay where you are. Uh, and that's why I'm in front of this garden here. Let's say we want to keep getting food out of our garden. What's something that we could have done before everything went down that would make it so that the food we get out of this garden here was a little bit safer. Well, this is one plan on, on, on our go list is to take some plastic sheeting and just lay it over this entire garden area. Now, is it gonna be perfect? Nope. Uh, after we take up that uh, plastic sheeting later on, is more radioactive dust probably gonna fall into the garden? Absolutely. But will the food that we're pulling out of the garden be safer if during the peak of the emergency we had some plastic cover to try to keep radioactive dust from you know falling all over the entire garden area yes and that is the key in emergency preparedness it's not about making your uh, yourself you know absolutely 100 percent perfectly safe it's not about living forever none of us are ever going to live forever it's just about trying to make it so you have more options in the future better options in the future and that your your future outlook is better than it would have been otherwise. So start thinking now about things that you might want to do if you want to set up some kind of a fallout shelter situation for your family. The one that I've created here I did many years ago and I'm glad that we have it. I know not everybody does have that, but you don't need something like that. You can build your own kind of uh, situation either, you know, dug into the earth or with cinder blocks or, you know, there are so many different options. I'd recommend Crescent Kearney's book, uh, Nuclear War Survival Skills, uh, for some basic DIY uh, types of shelters that you can build yourself uh, but whatever you decide to do you're going to get better results if you start thinking about it early and you have some kind of a plan in your head instead of entering into this situation with absolutely no plan and you know you and your family just running scared with no idea what to do I hope you found this video helpful I hope you find it inspiring uh, the challenges that we are facing are really irritating I really wish that the projects that I'm working on now we're not the projects that I'm working on right now. Uh, you can see the chickens are right next to the house right there. If I didn't have to do all this uh, SHIT related to SHTF, uh, you know, the project that I would have been doing this summer is instead of having the chickens right next to the house right there, I would have been clearing out a lot more of this forest and building their chicken coop right down there. And because of that, every morning at 4.30, my bedroom is right here and the chickens are right in here. They wake me up every single morning and every single morning that I woke, get woken up by the chickens, I'm always thinking, thank you, uh, you know, geopol geopolitical situation in the world for making it so I have to focus on things like, you know, burying, uh, digging a hole in the ground for my family to possibly have to use in an emergency versus, uh, you know, doing all sorts of other projects that I'd rather uh, do. Everything that we're facing right now, it is irritating, it can be frightening, but it's a lot less frightening if you have some kind of a plan involved. Uh, I'm sorry, if you have some kind of a plan in mind, and if, especially if you practice things and you know go over them ahead of time, because uh, whenever you are prepared for things, uh, they're gonna be so much less traumatic than they would be if you weren't prepared. And we saw so much of that during COVID. People that were in the prepping community, it wasn't a big deal because honestly, the pandemic we were all preparing for was one that was so much worse than what we ended up getting in that case. So for preppers, it was, it was kind of a cakewalk for a lot of us. But for people who had absolutely no preparation whatsoever, they still to this day have psychological scars on them from having lived through that. And we all lived through the exact same situation. And the only difference was some people thought about things ahead of time and had made some plans and the other people didn't. So if you have the opportunity to think about these things ahead of time and make some plans, you can, uh, you can 
create that difference in your life between going through a situation that is maybe irritating but not that bad and going through a situation that will possibly kill you or at the very least leave you with lifelong uh, emotional scars. So do some planning today, do some thinking today, and start coming up with solutions instead of just getting terrified by the problems themselves. That's it. Thanks for watching. This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com. Please subscribe and tune in every week for new videos. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so through Patreon or PayPal.